Good morning, my name's Josh McDonald and together with my friend Ashley Thompson uh, we co-direct a national prayer charity called Intercessors for Britain and a good number of intercessors up and down the country will be joining together this Saturday morning the 28th of January 2023 to cry out to God for our nation, uh, for the world, for our church particularly and today is the 25th of January and it's already uh, on this Wednesday been a very busy week in terms of what's going on uh, in the news and in the world and in the church and interesting debate yesterday in the House of Parliament regarding the relationship uh, between uh, the world and the church and particularly the government and church. Uh, we've had uh, in recent days uh, another person uh, banned from praying silently uh, in uh, the area surrounding an abortion clinic. We are considering things like the forthcoming ban on conversion therapy, which will impact the church greatly. There are many things happening in Scotland and in the relationship between Scotland and England with regards uh, the rights of children, uh, the issues of identity, of sexuality, of gender. We are considering things like changes in relationships and sex education for children uh, across England and Wales, uh, but also beyond uh, as uh, it pertains to, uh, again, the issues of gender and identity and sexuality. And we see such suffering, don't we, in our nation, in the communities uh, around us, uh, particularly amongst young people. And some of these, I'm sure, will be the things that we will be praying into. And as we've considered and as we look and as you look at the things going on around us, I've been asking the question uh, a little bit more these past few days, what lies beneath? What's going on underneath all of this? And what's going on underneath and behind the things we see manifesting in the world? around us, what's going on uh, beneath and behind what we see going on in the church and what's going on in my heart deep down uh, to drive my actions, my emotions, my responses and I wonder perhaps what's going on in your heart. Well praise God, he is the one who reveals such things. He is the one who does not look at the outward appearance as it says in 1 Samuel 16 but he is the God who looks at the heart, he looks beneath. And I've been looking at the book of Ezekiel uh, this week. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, particularly uh, looking at chapters kind of 8 through 11. And it's an interesting period because Ezekiel is there in Babylon. He's there with the elders of Judah, uh, amongst whom he still has some authority, clearly, and some respect as the man of God who has the word of God. And he's the prophet in their midst. And here they are, exiled. Uh, likely they were taken away, perhaps in the first of three waves, uh, in which uh, the kingdom of Babylon took away the people of Judah from their own land to the land of Babylon. And, and likely that first wave was those who were elders, those who were leaders, those who were learned, those who were deemed to be uh, nobles in, in whatever discipline and yet there are still uh, some people and indeed still some uh, leaders of God's people, uh, elders of God's people left in Jerusalem and in chapter 8 of Ezekiel uh, he is caught up uh, in a vision uh, and in the vision he is he's lifted up uh, in the Holy Spirit and he's taken to see Jerusalem something he couldn't do physically and he's there sat in Babylon in the midst of uh, the elders and then suddenly he's transported away and we see uh, in verse 2 of chapter 8 this vision of fire the Lord's bright and shining there is uh, pictured as, as fire uh, and as glory and Ezekiel understandably with the vocabulary at his disposal in that moment struggles to explain and describe what he's seeing as many of God's servants uh, struggled similarly throughout scripture. And in verse 2 he, he, he says that he looks uh, and there was an appearance of fire uh, 
from the appearance of his waist and downward fire he sees the lord bright and blazing and in verse 4 it says behold the glory of the god of israel was there like the vision that i saw in the plain and i just want to take us through maybe 10 points very quickly sounds like a lot but we'll go through them at pace the journey that the lord takes ezekiel on and what the lord shows ezekiel and what that might mean for us today and as uh, in forthcoming days as we pray point one is this god shows ezekiel what the leaders of his people are doing in the dark and even what they are thinking so and it's by degrees uh, in verse three uh, we get a sense that there is this this idol uh, in god's place there in jerusalem uh, in verse 10 uh, ezekiel is is shown creeping things uh, inside uh, zion and god had previously declared such things an abomination in leviticus 11 and so that gives you a sense of where god's people are at and what they're allowing to take place in their midst in verse 11 we see mention of idol worship and and uncleanness Uh, in verse 14 it seems there's this some emotional attachment uh, to idols these women are weeping over tamuz and in verse 16 of chapter 8 there's worship of the sun of creation rather than the creator and in verse 17 we get this description of a brazen hard-headed rebellious people and yet it's verse 12 which i particularly want to pick up on here under point one he says son of man have you seen what the elders of the house of israel do in the dark every man in the room of his idols for they say the lord does not see us the lord has forsaken the land you see how the lord knows what we are thinking Point number two, the Lord's wrath is stirred as a consequence and deadly weapons are readied, but with a simultaneous plan for proceeding mercy. Praise God. There's an opportunity. We see that in chapter nine, verses one and two. Uh, The Lord's voice calls out, let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And yet there is also one man readied. He was clothed in linen, he has a writer's inkhorn at his side, and they go in and stand there before the Lord. Now, there is a call in verse 4 of chapter 9 for us to sigh and cry. For those that are there, should I say first, and, and perhaps for us to sigh and cry over what Ezekiel had revealed to him in chapter 8, so that they might be saved. It is those who sigh and cry over these abominations that will be saved. And then after him, after after the writer who puts a mark, it says, on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry, that they might be identified and recognised by the destroyer to come, it says after him, that, that instrument of mercy comes death without pity. Verse 5, it says, go after him through the city and kill Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. And he says in verse 6, begin at my sanctuary. Begin with the elders, begin with those leaders there, those representatives of God's people who are there. So that's point two. Wrath is stirred, but with mercy proceeding. Point three is Ezekiel intercedes. He is, remember, from chapter three, he is called by God to be a watchman that warns. But in the midst of this wrath that is poured out in Ezekiel's vision, he is moved to cry out for a remnant, to cry out that some might survive. And we might well remember Abraham and Moses and other intercessors before Ezekiel who did very similar. They stood before God and say and said, Lord, do not pour out all of your wrath that your people would be completely wiped out. And the Lord communicates something very deep to him uh, there in verse nine. It's almost like he's saying, I cannot hold back. Such is the extent of this evil. Um, It is uh, the greatest affront to him. Not that the actions are the thing which moves him to such wrath that cannot be held back. But it's actually the way in which the people lie about him. And do not properly convey what God has said. You see that in verse 9. 
Uh, he says, the Lord speaking, the iniquity of the house of Israel in Judah is exceedingly great. And then he says, for they say the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. That was not the truth. That was not what God had said. And that is what seemingly moves him to such wrath. Seemingly, there's no recourse. Uh, there's no way back. But remember, there is that writer. There is that writer who holds the ink. And in verse 11, praise God, he's still there and he returns to say, I've done as you commanded me. He marks out the remnant. He marks out the remnant. Uh, verse, uh, sorry, point four, should I say, um, of these 10 that I'm just going to race through here. Uh, the fire falls. The fire falls. Chapter 10, verse two. He spoke to that man clothed with linen, the one who has marked out the remnant, and says, go in among the wheels under the cherub, this incredible vision of cherubim, which is now being set before Ezekiel in verse one of chapter 10, that presence of God. And he says, go in among the wheels under the cherub, fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in as I watched, says Ezekiel. There's these coals. It might remind him of Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah is made aware of his sin before a thrice holy God. And the Lord makes a way through an angel, as, as here through the cherubim, to cleanse his, Isaiah's sin through that burning coal of fire. And here there is a cleansing, it seems, going on through fire. And it's given to this man. In verse 7 it says, The cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire and took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed with linen, who took it and went out. God's servant who marks out his remnant is given the fire with which to purify, it seems. Point five, we see God's glory and it pauses at the threshold of God's house. And it is full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. You see that in verse four of chapter 10. So the glory is there, it's, it's lifted up, and yet it pauses over the threshold of God's house. There's a moment where the glory waits, it seems. And point six is that the glory departs. We see that in verse eight. Uh, sorry, verse 18, should I say, of chapter 10. Verse 18 of chapter 10. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. Point seven is this. The prophecy of the sword comes. The prophecy of the sword. And we see that in chapter 11, verse 8. The prophecy of the sword which Ezekiel brings, he brings to the leaders and it says this. You have feared the sword and I will bring a sword upon you, says the Lord God. It's a forecast of exile. You see that in verse nine, where it says, and I will bring you out of its midst and deliver you into the hands of strangers and execute judgment on you. Judgments, sorry, plural, on you. I will deliver you into the hands of strangers. It's a forecast of exile. And that, that purpose behind it is that they might know that he is the Lord. Chapter 11, verse 10. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. It's because they have walked, it says, according to the Gentiles. Verse 12 of chapter 11. They've walked according to the customs of the world around them. The pagan nations who do not go uh, after the Lord or know him. That's why. Point eight we see the response, immediate, an immediate response of uh, seeming judgment, a leader dies. A leader that in Ezekiel's vision, he is communicating this burden, this prophecy to, falls immediately. He's called Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah. And this uh, prompts uh, Ezekiel's intercession again in this moment. He, it's the second time he said effectively the same thing. Lord, will you destroy all? Will you destroy all of your people? And you see that in verse 13. He says, ah, oh, Lord God, will you make a complete end of the remnant of Israel? Point nine of the ten uh, that we could pick out of these few chapters. Uh, 
is that it is when the leaders thought that they were secure, when the leaders thought they were secure and would not be moved from their place, they were thinking that, well, the people will suffer, the people will be carried off, but we will stay. They will be expelled, but we will be fine. We will cling to what we believe is, is ours, um, but they will go. There's a, it seems there is perhaps a heartlessness on, this, on their part towards the people, but also a longing for power, a clinging to it. And yet the contrast is that the Lord has compassion on those people in verse 15. Uh, verse 15, uh, we see uh, that uh, the Lord sees the thinking in the leaders, as I've just said. And then in verse 16, uh, the Lord says, although I've cast them far off among the Gentiles and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Hallelujah. The Lord has compassion on those who are scattered, those who must leave that place he has compassion on them he goes with them to make a place for them as they are scattered and finally point 10 there is a final prophecy a final prophecy here in chapter 11 which speaks forward and speaks future uh, to a future where God's people will be restored again in their own land hallelujah we have lived to see that and also perhaps beyond us to a place and a time where God's people, the Jews, will be given a new heart, a heart of flesh, and, and be given a soft heart to see the Lord and to commune with him in, in covenant, intimate relationship. And in verse 21 of chapter 11, uh, we see this, this final promise, this final statement of the Lord. Uh, but as for those whose hearts follow the desire for their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Their deeds will come on their own heads. Well, it's sobering, isn't it? Let's just race through those 10 points uh, by way of recollection. For, firstly, point one, God shows Ezekiel what the leaders of the people are doing in the dark and even to what they are thinking. Point two, wrath is stirred and deadly weapons are readied, but... There is a simultaneous plan for proceeding mercy. Point three is Ezekiel the intercessor for the first time. Point four is the fire falling. Point five is the glory that pauses at the threshold of God's house. Point six, the glory departs. Point seven, there is a prophecy of the sword given to the leaders. Point eight, a leader falls immediately before the judgment of the Lord. Point nine is those leaders thought they were secure and they, they gave up those that followed them so that they might cling to their place and to their power. And they were heartless. They were heartless shepherds in the process. And yet the Lord has compassion on those sheep and makes a place and a way for them. And finally, point 10, that final prophetic vision of God's mercy to come and yet his justice in ensuring that those who commit such deeds will have those deeds poured out on their own head. Well, friends, I hope that as we look at this pattern in Ezekiel chapters 8 through to 11, we see something of a pattern for how we might pray in these times. We see something of a lens by which we might see the house of God, those that operate and work within the house of God, those who we might say and see as a remnant and the way that the Lord contends for them and makes a place for them. We see a way in which we might pray for that remnant and a way in which we might long and in our prayers long that the fire might fall, that God would pour out his judgment and his wrath on his house and those who stand and those who make idols in his place. And that in that we might see a measure of demarcation between those who are his and those who are not. That in that we might see a measure of the Lord's mercy to draw out and bring out those who are truly his in this time of great shaking and of great separation. And that as we pray and we cry out, God will be faithful to restore a place in which his name might dwell now in our day. That he is going to be faithful to make his people and cause his people to stand and display his name to the entire world at some point 
in the future. And that we might not pray that God would restrain perhaps his hand from his house, but that he might come and deal with his house, that judgment might begin at his house, that we might be found to be on the right side of that judgment, and that the Lord would pour out his spirit in great power and mercy upon us in this place. I pray that this is an encouragement, that this is an instruction, and we look forward to being together and to praying this coming Saturday and beyond. Amen.